Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's WJE webinar, Champlain Tower South Collapse Investigation. My name is Liz Pimper, and I'll be your moderator. During the next hour, structural engineers Matthew Fadden and Gary Klein will detail WJE's investigation of the 2021 Champlain Tower South collapse in Surfside, Florida, including our findings and collapse theory based on the evidence, material testing, and analysis. This presentation is copyrighted by West Jenny Elsner Associates. And now I will hand it over to Gary to get us started. Gary? Thanks, Liz. Hello, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Gary Klein, Senior Principal and Executive Vice President of Wish Janey Elsner Associates. Excluding incidents due to terrorist attacks, the collapse of the Champlain Towers South condominiums in Surfside, Florida, was the most significant U.S. structural failure in 40 years in terms of lost lives, tragically. 98 people died in the collapse. Our thoughts and condolences remain with the families and friends of the victims. 40 years earlier, 114 people lost their lives in the collapse of the walkways in the Kansas City Hyatt Regency Hotel. I remember that all too well because as a young engineer, I worked for WJE on that investigation also. As would be expected, Several civil loose lawsuits were filed on behalf of the families of the Champlain Towers victims. Based on our experience in collapse investigations, WJE was retained by the law firm for the Condominium Association to investigate the cause of the collapse and provide engineering support for the civil litigation. The investigation was led by me as senior investigator and from our South Florida office by Dr. Matt Fadden who will present our findings today. Matt received his PhD from the University of Michigan and taught at the University of Kansas before joining WJE, where he has led dozens of structural investigations. Matt? Thank you, Gary, and, and thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, like Gary said, our, our hearts go out to the, the victims and their families and, and, and loved ones. Um, and at the same time, I hope that some of the work that we do and that others have done related to this investigation can help move structural engineering forward. With that, let's set a, a little bit of framework for today's discussion. Um, today's presentation is, is meant to be for everyone. And so please understand that some things may be more technical than you're comfortable with or less technical than you had hoped. Um, please understand that we're trying to you know, meet a wide audience here. And so if you have questions, please ask them. We will answer almost all, all, all your questions. Um, if we don't get it to it today, we'll, we'll deal with it um, via email later. Um, that being said also, uh, you know, this is WJE's investigation. We really should note there are many other investigations that happened, um, those from other civil litigants, but also uh, federal and state uh, or, or, or uh, city run investigations. Um, most notably though is NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies um, an ongoing investigation, um, which will be extensive and include things like experimental testing uh, of, uh, of, mo of mock-up specimens and things like that. And so uh, we look forward to those results. On this slide are the AIA learning objectives. And we also want to acknowledge uh, the, the the group that we worked with. Um, Michael Goldberg was the receiver, the court appointed receiver for the association, and Brenda Rodmacher both represented the insurance company that we we worked with, um, as well as the, a WJE staff from across ten different offices, really. And so it was a, a real team effort. Um, this investigation. So the outline of this presentation today really fits into kind of our. Uh, our investigation approach. And that was uh, document review, um, which in, to, to be fair, I think our document review is probably one of the most uh, significant in terms of scope, um, since we did have all the association files that were available. Uh, the site investigation, which included both on site at the collapse site and at the NIST evidence facility, laboratory studies that we carried out in conjunction with other parties um, in, in, as part of the litigation and then structural analysis that we did in-house um, and, and finally all getting towards our collapse theory. And so we'll get uh, by the end to the collapse theory here. So let's start with just setting the stage and what we knew on June 24th, 2021. 
we knew that uh, a building had partially collapsed about 1.30 in the morning. And we woke up to pictures like this on the news where over 100 people were feared missing and dead. And, and the cause was really unclear. We could see that the building had pancaked um, and, and that it appeared to have stopped at a central shear wall. Um, but, but really the, the best news we were getting at that time was from social media uh, videos and photos posted online. And so, uh, like many, we were all in the dark. And, and if you're engineers, we were all in the office chatting about it uh, the following week. Things we were hearing, though, were things that, uh, you know, there was ongoing work on the roof. And, and when we started looking at those photos, um, we had some idea that, you know, potentially a lot of that stuff didn't really check out. Um, not enough load, in our opinion. One thing that was abundantly clear when we looked at, at this, and, and this is gonna come up a lot in our discussion today, is there were a lot of punched columns, especially in the pool deck area, but also in the collapsed portions of the structure. And so we had some thought that punching shear um, and this pool deck area had an important part to play in the actual collapse of the structure. Just a little more description about Champlain Tower South. It's a 12-story L-shaped structure and it was built in 1981. It uses reinforced concrete flat plate construction where you have um, uh, flat plate slabs and columns and very little limited use of beams in this. Today we often use post tensioning or something to, to make this more efficient, um, but at the time this was fairly ubiquitous. Um, parking on the lobby deck level and basement garage was uh, is everywhere essentially on this structure. So anywhere you look at Champlain Tower South, other than where exactly the pool is underneath, there is a basement parking garage. And there's also a pool deck terrace in the southeast corner that we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about. Um, and that's in the southeast corner of the structure. At the time in, in, in 1981, when this building was constructed, the 79 South Florida Building Code was the, the, the standard. And that would have referenced the ACI 318 1977 edition of the uh, concrete, uh, reinforced concrete uh, code. There's some importance to this. It lacked, uh, in 1977, there was no requirement for integrity reinforcement. And there was also more recent changes that would have helped mitigate some of the issues that were at Champlain Towers in the most recent edition, the 318-19 edition of the code. Here's the Champlain Tower site. Uh, you have a kind of transparent overlay of of a, uh, an Earth, an Google Earth image, right? And you can see the Atlantic Ocean would be to the east and Collins Avenue, the west, and Collins Avenue is the main drag up and down Miami Beach and through Surfside. When we remove that overlay, you can really easily see the outline of this, the L-shaped outline of the structure. And then again, the pool deck area is to the southeast or in the bottom right corner of this image. Some of the most useful things uh, that you find, you know, during an investigation uh, are, are not always to be expected to be useful. And, and, and one particular place was looking at these architectural drawings and seeing parking spot numbers. And once that ends up happening is that these parking spot numbers become extremely important in our understanding of, uh, of where columns are located further on. Uh, what we learned is that the parking spots really remained largely unchanged uh, since 1981. And so we were able to identify columns and you'll see that as we go through some of the photos in this investigation. A lot of work was done to this structure over the years. And so um, there were some indications in the news early on that nothing had been done to this building or it was in you know, need of repair. And that, that's you know, uh, partially true. However, a lot, in, in, and that's you know, on the need of repair side. Um, but on the, on the nothing that's been done side, you know, it's not a fully correct statement. A lot had been done over the years um, and we know of works you know, in 1996 all the way up through 2018 in 2021 that was ongoing. Many different engineers and, and, and contractors and architects had been to the site. Whether or not the good information was given to them or good decisions were made by the association is a matter for a, 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 a different discussion. The big thing that happened though is in 1996, uh, a, a, a sand and paver layer was added to the original concrete, uh, reinforced concrete pool deck. And so a, a thicker layer was, was added and additional weight was added. At the same time, waterproofing was done as well as some structural repairs. And this was signed off by an engineer um, and, and, and the town had approved all of this work. And then in 2018, the, the condo was undergoing its 40 year recertification process. And if you're not from South Florida or in Miami, 
or Florida now in general. Um, you may not be familiar with the recertification process, but essentially it's a process where uh, an engineer comes, looks at a structure and, and then it writes a report and then repairs are required to be made if, if, if needed. Um, the recertification report was done a few years early, which uh, you know helps get things going, especially when a lot of repairs are required. And the, the, at that time they found abundant cracking and spalling in the garage and, and a lot of efflorescence, indicating that there were some water leakage problems. Um, they found that pre, uh, the recertification engineer found that previous repairs were failing due to poor workmanship, and they recommended following good just industry standard practices um, and recommended that some repairs be uh, quite extensive. And so some full depth, uh, full, almost full repair um, uh, of some areas of the structure. So uh, it went from some minor repairs all the way up to some very extensive repairs. And, and the, the end price tag was uh, pretty significant in terms of the amount of repairs that were required. The recertification investigation gave some really insightful information for our understanding of the behavior or, or the as-built conditions of this structure and the, uh, and kind of the overtime uh, uh, milestones that are that were happening at the structure. And so, one thing that was really important was uh, a set of, of cores that was taken from both the pool deck and the parking area to the. Um, to the left, the bottom left on the screen here. And so we're gonna zoom into the kind of nook of the L here. You can see highlighted in this orange box and we're zooming in and you can see a test probe A and a test probe B were each taken. Well, test probe B is in the parking deck and test probe A is in the pool deck area. And test probe A would have had sand and pavers on it, but those would be removed um, prior to uh, the coring process. What ultimately we end up seeing is that the deck is not uh, as it was originally finished. And we know that in 1996, sand and pavers were added, so that's a given. Um, but some other things uh, were, were noticeably important. And so let's take this one by one. So on the left, you see the, the parking deck uh, core. And what you can see is there was a topping slab added uh, to a, above the structural slab. Um, and you can see the bar, and the bar is actually in fairly good condition, not showing any real signs of corrosion at, at that point. On the right, you can see the pool deck core, uh, you see a tile and mortar layer. Tile and mortar layer was actually found to be the same as specified in the original architectural drawing. Then you see the topping slab layer, and then the structural slab. Um, things in general uh, uh, for the structural slab lined up with the, the design documents. However, uh, the topping slab was notably not present on the original design documents. However, we, we think that the engineer uh, at the time must have known about this topping slab as the tile and mortar layer uh, would have been would have been installed originally. Again, the pool deck area is also not showing a, a layer of sand and pavers that would have been above. One other thing we just need to point out right away is that in, even in this core, uh, we're finding excessive cover uh, on, uh, on the structural slab. And what I'll, I'll lead on to later is that this excessive cover um, can lead to reduced uh, punching shear uh, capacity. And so uh, just something to keep in mind, and we'll come back to this. Again, uh, not, uh, the, the concrete topping slab, again, was not included in the original structural drawings. And then uh, additional pavers and waterproofing were added on the pool deck area of the slab. And again, the, real, the real gist of this is there was a lot of load on this slab that may have not actually been considered by the original engineer. Another thing that was, it was quite interesting is that when we're looking between uh, the the original drawing set and the recertification set or uh, repair set and just photos in general of the site is we noticed that there was planters were there were a lot more planters than originally designed and so that's something to really note planters can be quite heavy um, and, and, and so again another spot where there's potentially additional load on this deck the recertification recertification engineer did a lot of work in terms of uh, re reorganizing some areas of the building. And in that sense, um, they reorganized uh, the entrance ramps. And because of that, they needed to do some analysis uh, related to the framing. And so they ran some calculations in a software called SP Slab um, and added some flexural bars um, uh, along column line T, for example, and some other locations as well. Um, notably, though, the results of their punching shear analysis come out to show exceeding 
uh, uh, values for every column along that column line T. Uh, one thing we do know is that there is no record in their in their um, in their their file essentially uh, of any calculations related to the pool deck area. And so it's a little concerning that some, some of these were exceeded and you'll see with some of the other distress uh, coming later that there is a concern that this was somewhat missed. Column L131 and column K131 shown in the pool deck area also showed some signs, some signs of significant uh, distress related to punching. And so we'll focus here first on column L131, um, which is circled to the right. And it's kind of in the field of the pool deck area. And then the next slide will show you column K131 um, two really important things here. Uh, one is the date. Uh, this is November 13th, 2020, about eight months before the actual collapse. Um, a photo was taken by the, the engineers and they note a lot of water and efflorescence streaming down this column. And so this is not a recent sort of uh, crack. This has been happening and this is uh, a, a kind of chronic condition uh, around this column. L13-1, and here you can see the parking spot number 76 that I mentioned earlier. How does this happen? There's other ways for water to start streaming down faces of columns, but putting two and two together and figuring out there is a punching shear related issue with this column. Punching shear forms as kind of a, this slab detaching from the column. The easiest way I think to look out of it, if I'm explaining to uh, just anyone is imagine a piece of a pen, uh, pencil going through a piece of paper kind of deal. And that's what we're, we're understanding here. And, and what can happen is it will form a shear crack. Uh, and th those inclined shear cracks are, are shown there. And ultimately, a, a, plane, a failure plane is developed. And through that cra those cracks, water can ingress and then flow down the face of the column. Um, and this should have been a, a warning sign for those engineers that there was some punching related distress here. The other one is a bit more nuanced, and, so, and this is a, a, a photo taken on June 2nd, 2021, uh, just, just about three weeks before the actual collapse. And this was taken um, by the engineer that was working on the site, and the, the property manager had moved this trash can out of the way to show the engineer the distress at this planter. Um, what you can see here is that there was, this is, uh, again, over K131, and so there's a large planter over this. You can see the deflection of the bulb end of the planter and large cracks forming um, following uh, the deflection of the deck below. Here's a photo closer up of the, co the corner there, and you can see that, that vertical displacement. This is all likely due to uh, a punching shear, re punching related distress at the slab below. The interesting thing is to note is that a year before on April 13th, 2020, there was no distress. Okay. And so I, I just want to take a step back and, 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 you know, have people understand that punching was slowly progressing around this deck. And that's what we believe was happening. And so there is no, you know, that it, a lot of people have this fear that punching is an immediate trigger. And while it is not, a, while it is a non-ductile failure mode, um, i.e. it does not give much warning. And you can see that from the, the figure of L, uh, L13.1. Um, it, it, it can progress and loads can change or, or can be redistributed and that will result in uh, giving you a little bit of time and a little bit of warning. Um, here is the ultimate collapse state. Uh, you can see the, the top of the planter, column K13-1 is circled. And actually I have the bottom arrow pointing at the stains on the deck to kind of show you how I picked out where K13-1 is, just using that as a reference. Other really useful information was things like the garage walkthrough videos that were, were present um, and other videos and things that had been posted online. Uh, one of our interns spent you know, an entire week looking at uh, this garage walkthrough video and making uh, frame by frame, making maps of distress and as built conditions. And these can be really useful for those, those cases. Again, we can see columns and we can identify column numbers and, and, verify, and, and attempt to verify sizes. Um, at the same time, we can see things like steps in the slab that weren't, weren't fully clear in the, the, the structural documents. And it was really easy to see if you look at the conduit, the bends in the conduit. Other things that you could see here too were distress to the soffit of the, of the pool deck slab, right? And that's highlighted in that orange box. You can see that there's distress, there's some peeling of paint likely due to water ingress in, in that area. Areas towards the step are, are getting into underneath the building, and so it's not surprising that there's not as much distress in those directions. 
the, the one thing I also want to mention in this slide is beam A. Um, beam A is, is shown here. It was shown on the original structural drawings as well. It's unclear. The detailing was very unclear. Um, and so seeing that in this image was, is also an extremely helpful for us in under, our understanding of the ad fill conditions. Another video that, that is really helpful in our understanding of the kind of timeline of the collapse is this TikTok video. And this TikTok video was taken by somebody staying at the Blue Green Resort just to the north of Champlain Towers, and they felt the rush of air uh, come out of the garage as the pool deck collapsed. Um, and, they, and they took some video down into the garage, and it's really uh, challenging to see. But the, the important part to note here is that uh, in this video, we are corroborating evidence that the pool deck had collapsed and there is, is, is uh, debris on the ground. And the last and really interesting video um, is this video from Unit 711. And we're standing at kind of their, um, their right near their balcony, looking in towards the, the apartment. And what we can see is that uh, the, the building is moving a significant amount. And that indicates that there's likely some significant amount of column failure below or subsidence of the building, causing uh, some large movements of the structure up seven stories. And so if I stop it here, you can see the, the kink in that wall that's happening. And this is right, before, I mean, we believe to be right before the collapse. Um, so after the pool deck collapse, there's likely some really significant uh, movement of this structure. And we'll, we'll go through all of that as we get through this presentation. A lot of residents made some very good observations. Uh, Unit 111 was right there. They were present during the, the early stages of the collapse. They heard construction, what they believed to be construction noises starting at 1230 in the morning. And they, they visually saw and heard the pool that collapse along with the security guard between 110 and 115 in the morning. Another resident, Unit 611, uh, uh, also corroborates that kind of large movements of the structure uh, via the, the visually seeing cracks in our walls and the inability to open certain doors. And so the resident observations are, are really helpful in us understanding uh, what, what happened and the actual timeline of the structure, the structural collapse. So here's, here's the collapse timeline. Um, what you can see is that it's a two stage event. The first stage is one, the collapse of the pool deck itself. And then about seven to 12 minutes later, the east, the eastern portion of this tower, tower two, uh, or sorry, area two failed. Um, the red circle uh, highlighting down there the, the failure of the columns in that location. Subsequently to area two, behind it, area three collapses, and then area four collapses about eight seconds later, and that's due to a, a shear wall that's present. Finally, the western portion of the tower does not collapse, but was subsequently uh, imploded uh, due to some instability during the rescue effort. So that's our document review. Next, let's talk about our site investigation. WJA was finally able to get on site in October of 2021, along with all the other civil litigants. And this is what the site looked like at that time. It looked fairly barren. However, there was an extensive amount of useful information still present at the site. The first thing we wanted to know was, was this a geotechnical related problem? And so we're gonna have one slide on geotech related issues here, um, but please understand we, along with many of the other parties, we had a, a very extensive geotechnical investigation. But this I think sums it up. The first thing we did was we had a surveyor come to the site and, and, and mark elevations all throughout the slab. And we looked at the changes in elevation on that slab. And here is plotted on, a, on using a method called Krigging to get contour plots of the slab. And we can see that the, the slab really only varies within about two and a half inches of either direction uh, of the average um, throughout uh, the entire deck. These, this deck would have been integrally, integrally connected with uh, the columns and, if, or columns and then subsequently with the footings. And if those footings had had failed or moved significantly, we would expect to see some distress on the slab. And frankly, there was none there. So that was really our first indication that this likely wasn't a geotechnical related problem. And again, a lot of other geotechnical work was done um, and we have a fairly good understanding of, of the foundation system. Uh, other issues uh, like concrete material properties and uh, as-built conditions of columns were, were, were figured out through coring and chipping uh, and, and um, other sampling. 
Additionally, we took samples of the, the waterproofing on the pool deck area that was still, still present. And so there was a significant amount of sampling that was done, and we'll show you some of the results of that sampling uh, later on. Again, this was all in conjunction with uh, the, the litigation and all the parties participated uh, in this sampling. The, the other really interesting site that we were able to visit and very insightful air, place that we were able to visit is the NIST uh, primary evidence facility. And it was two bays of, of, um, of uh, structural remnants from the, the collapse. And it was really just triage and it is just jam packed with pieces of building. And, it, and for those who are there, they know how hard it was to get through uh, this site and, and understand what they were looking at. Here's us flying a drone. So the images you were just seeing are stitched images from a drone that we flew over the site to, to map all the evidence. You can see the map that we created of all that evidence. And there's a few insightful pieces and we'll talk about those. There was also a, there were two bays. There, what I just showed was the North Bay and there was also a South Bay, which included some more portions from the collapsed part of the building. Um, but it also included a lot of pieces from the imploded part of the building, really to help get an idea of as built conditions. Three items I'm gonna talk about today are, are really insightful and helpful for our investigation. The first one was a piece of punch slab and it's kind of hard to see because it's just half of a punch slab um, and half of a hole related to that punch. Um, however, to help help you imagine, there's there's me in my PowerPoint skills drawing uh, the, the additional piece of that slab that may have been there and helping you understand that there would have been uh, reinforcement transversing in either direction over that punch punched area. The other thing that we again note at that slab is the fact that there's excessive cover again. And and I didn't really mention it earlier, but the cover was meant to be three quarters of an inch between uh, the top of the top layer of the bar and the top of the slab. This has an important effect on the punching shear capacity, and we'll talk about this here in a, in a couple minutes, but an excessive cover will reduce the overall punching shear capacity. And so again, we're seeing excessive cover and again, likely reductions in punch and shear capacity. Finally, this is just what a column, one of the columns that would have looked like uh, uh, that had punched through the slab. Uh, another element extremely important, and I, I noted it earlier was beam A. And beam A uh, supported uh, the, the kind of stepped area uh, near units 111 um, uh, of the pool deck. This beam type A, uh, framed in from the pool deck area into the the building, and so this orange column that's sitting right at the front, right where unit one, right in front of unit one eleven, is right at the south wall of the structure. We were able to find a couple beam A's. They were, uh, unsurprisingly, pretty in pretty rough shape since they would have been right at the center of the kind of collapse uh, uh, initiation of the collapse, and they would uh, they they did though still provide some important understanding of the detailing that was there. The last item that we found very interesting and, and, and very insightful was this item 341, which is a column that we know comes from an exterior wall um, uh, of the building, and it would have had a beam A framing into it. Um, the exact location is unknown. However, we do know that the, the central core of this, this column was very much shifted uh, out, of the, out of center. Um, and so in plan, the actual reinforcement should have been more like what I'm showing on the left with the orange, uh, highlighted orange and shaded areas. Um, however, that was not the case. What that means though, is that the BMA may not have, may not have framed in appropriately. The detailing could have been off um, and it made, made this uh, area even more uh, conducive for the failure that we were about to talk about or the failure mechanism we're about to talk about. In addition, you can see, uh, 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 with the arrows on the left here, the top slab bars framing in, as well as the bottom bars for the beam A framing into the column. Uh, a significant amount of laboratory testing was carried out on the samples that we collected from the, the, the site. Uh, this is just looking at one set of samples, but the real gist of it is a lot of the material properties were very typical to what we expect in Florida. Um, uh, the corrosion that we saw on bars that we sampled was consistent with that at the time of placement, i.e. there was no bar that was significantly corroded that we sent in to, to be sampled. Um, and then finally, 
the, the concrete had low chlorides and low carbonation in certain areas and indicating that there was no you know, real mechanical problem that would have led to distress, or I should say chemical problem that would lead to distress uh, of the concrete itself. Material properties came out fairly normal for everything. And in fact, the pool deck area actually had uh, better than expected average compressive strength. Um, steel reinforcement was also just totally fine and, and no issues in terms of material properties. So how does this all fit together? So what we're gonna do now is step through some of our, our, our analysis and our understanding of what we believe um, you know, initiated the collapse and that's the punching shear failures in the pool deck area. And so here I'm again highlighting the punching shear failures and you, on the right you can see uh, the idea of the mechanism of punching shear. Again, we had two areas where we recognized that punching shear had happened or, or was initiated. Column K131 shown on the right and column L131 um, shown on the left. Um, both you know, very, showing very different uh, manifestations of the same mechanism. Punching shear is a, a phenomenon, and again, I'll, I'll, uh, for, for uh, simplicity's sake, I'll relate it to uh, a, a pen going through a piece of paper uh, is easier to punch through than a marker going through a piece of cardboard. So if you kind of think of it that term, you've got the kind of easy way to think about it. From an engineering viewpoint, we know it's dependent on the concrete strength and the effective depth D and a critical perimeter B naught. So the punching shear capacity is, is related to a four times the square root of F prime C. So that's the, the, the concrete material properties, B naught times D. And D is related to the clear cover. And so this is where we're getting back to, if the clear cover goes up, D gets smaller and we reduce our punching shear capacity. And so having low bar or excessive clear cover can really affect our punching shear capacity. On top of that, current research is showing that Punching shear is really dependent on flexural reinforcement in the slab. And so these bars that you see going in either direction that I'm showing here in the picture on the left. And so the amount of flexural reinforcement that's there. And actually in this case, uh, a coefficient of four is likely not really appropriate and unconservative. You must remember that the, this, this four square roots of F prime C equation is a design equation and not a prediction equation uh, for behavior. WJ had a large uh, finite element model that we used extensively in our uh, assessment and analysis of this structure. Um, it could help us understand things like unbalanced moments uh, and, and other properties, you know, and uh, analytical properties of the structure. Um, however, I'm just going to step you through a hand calc to, to make this, this easier, but I just wanted to show the extent of our investigation. So let's take a look at column K13.1, and it's circled there, and it's one that's uh, right at that planter and it's the one that showed the most distress and not surprisingly based on our analysis it's the most heavily loaded column in that pool deck area and it's due to the fact that it has large tributary area and is supporting a, a planter so k131 is highlighted um, on the on the left here and what we can see is that in the i guess what i'm going to show you is that in the as design case this column was never designed appropriately in the, for punching. Um, and this slab was never designed appropriately for punching. And so what we'll do is we're going to compare two cases. We're going to compare as designed and at collapse. And there's some important nuance here. So in the as designed condition, we would, we would note the column size, note the capacity, the, the, uh, the concrete uh, strength, that's 4,000 PSI. We'd have a clear cover assumed of 3 quarters of an inch as specified, as I discussed before. And then we'd have a, a, a factored load of 266 kips, which includes dead load, but also live load, the, the effects of people and things that are on top of the slab. And then it, we, would, we would come up with a reduced, what we call a reduced nominal capacity of 155 kip. And just a reminder, kip is 1,000 pounds. So um, this is 155,000 pounds um, nominal capacity. This has safety factors built into it. Um, so we have factor loads and reduced nominal capacities. What that means is there's a safety factor there. And we always want our capacity to be greater than our load, applied load, and that is not the case here. And so from day one, uh, this, this structure was under designed and about, by about 70%. And that's what our demand capacity ratio is showing. It's showing the, the, the load demand over the capacity. 
Um, at collapse is a very different uh, condition. And, and again, this is just assuming four roots F prime C. At collapse is a, a slightly different condition, right? Because now we're assuming uh, what we believe to be the most correct material property. So based on ASTM C42, we, we come up with about a 5,000 PSI concrete strength. We know that the clear cover was excessive. So there's gonna be, a, we're showing a higher clear cover and thus a reduced effective depth of D. Um, and now we're just estimating load. This in this case is only just the dead load. There's no live load assumed. Um, we don't believe there was any significant amount of live load on the deck that night. And we have a nominal capacity of 150 kip based on four roots F prime C. Again, or sorry, not again, but in this case, there is no safety factor applied. If we do that, we come up with a demand capacity ratio of 0.85. What that means is our, load, our applied load is less than our capacity, meaning that likely wouldn't fail. However, I just want to have you just kind of think outside the box here. And I, I mentioned that, um, that, that four root F prime C is likely uh, unconservative. And that's really true. And so if we took things down to something like three roots F prime C, we would get to failure quite quickly. And why did I pick three? Uh, just to be simple. But in the real world, what we did, we looked at um, critical shear crack theory and, and Eurocode and, and, and found that um, we were really approaching something much closer to three than, than being at a, a four root F prime C value based on our understanding of the flexural reinforcement. Therefore, this, this column in this slab at K13.1 had been sitting very near its capacity for a very long time. Um, and, and one should also note that concrete is a time dependent material in terms of its behavior. Other things were also not great on this slab. We found even positive moments were under design on the order of two times or, or half of what they should have been. And so um, the as design condition of this slab, was, even in the negative bending regions was also not good. So you were ending up with a, a structure that was, uh, especially in the pool deck area that was significantly under designed. So finally, let's get into our theory of collapse. So here's what we believe happened. The pool deck to the south of the building failed. This was reported by the residents and we have video documentation, i.e. that TikTok video. We also have that there were definitely observable after the fact, observable punching shear related failures that, and the pool deck area. We then believe that the failure that pool deck applies uh, some sort of horizontal force to the building columns and da essentially damages the building columns and causes them to, to uh, fail. Um, and, and, and potentially not all right away, but move significantly right away. The horizontal forces are a result of two things uh, likely, one bending and the other potentially some catenary action. Um, and then further and most and importantly, the strength of the, the, the slab and the interface of the structure is really diminished by the steps in the building. Um, and we'll show some, some thoughts about that here in a few slides. These forces fail the column at the south exterior wall, resulting in the progressive and partial collapse of the tower. Um, and then the remaining Western portion remains due to the shear wall at the elevator floor. So let's take again, a look at column line K in that pool deck area. Again, I wanna align you with just reminding you of beam A. Beam A is uh, supporting at the south face of that building, the interface between uh, the, the, the southern wall of the building and the terrace, step terrace areas uh, of the slab. Here you'll see beam A again, highlighted on the right uh, just above the, the car furthest to the right. What you can see here is, is the, our, our, our belief about what happened likely before April 13, 2020. Please remember that April 13th is the last time I have a photo that shows that the slab is not in a distress, uh, uh, extremely distressed state with cracking in the plant. Three, however, we do believe that there were likely uh, shear cracks formed around column, flexural and shear cracks formed around columns, allowing water to ingress in. Between April 13th, but sometime before June 2nd, 2021, and, and based on the photo we show here, right, the, the photo above K131, we know that there was some significant movement of the slab below. And we can see that highlighted here. Um, and so we know that there was some extensive distress uh, to the slab um, at, 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 in the pool deck area. What we then believe subsequently happened, and we do believe that around K13-1 was likely one of the one of the likely most likely locations of the initial uh, punching shear failure. 
what happens is you have an initial failure and then subsequent areas are are well still also well under designed and not capable of, of taking up any more load and then we'll we'll fail in sequence so you'll have uh, uh, initial failure at, uh, where where you finally get enough movement and, and loss of capacity that the neighbors cannot no longer hold on and the slab begins to fail and collapse at that time uh, horizontal forces as it's collapsing one just due to catenary but two also more likely just due to large deflections um, uh, apply forces horizontal forces to the to the column uh, along the south wall of the structure and then ultimately collapse and the important part is is the subsidence of the structure a large movement of the structure happened it, it which we believe hung up for you know five to seven minutes right then then the rest of the structure collapsed. let's take a look, closer look at this area here we're going to jump into kind of a closer look um, the stepping of the slab makes this very complex and, and diminish like i said before diminishes the strength uh, one because there's hooks and splices and laps that are required in this area what I'm showing here is orange again for the additional horizontal forces that were added. But please remember that this also had a moment couple that would have had to been developed due to just normal deflection or movement of the structure. And that's highlighted in blue, right? So there's additional force added there that needed to be uh, uh, handled at the top um, top side of BMA. So significant movement happens. And in this case, again, I'm showing, I'm, I'm supposing that the, the core has shifted over considerably. And so you're not really getting very good uh, uh, development into uh, of the, the top bars um, of the slab slash beam A into the, the deck. Um, I'm sorry, into the core of the column. And, and again, uh, further diminishing its capacity. Um, we believe then that it damaged the column enough that results in failure and, and a large vertical movement or subsidence of that column. Ultimately, ending with the collapse of the parking deck around 120, or sorry, collapse of the building around 122 in the morning. So let's just summarize here. There are, are, are several mistakes that appear to have contributed to this collapse. And the first one is, and first foremost, is the inadequate design of the pool deck, especially for punching tube. Um, but we also talked about other issues related to this. There was also excess weight on the pool deck, um, an o a concrete overlay not shown on the drawings, the addition of pavers in 1996, and very large planters that were not necessarily accounted for in the original design. There was shallow top reinforcement um, that would have been known to many until until after the collapse. However, um, it, did, it, cre it did further decrease the uh, effective depth and, and subsequently decreased the punching shear capacity. Unfortunately, the engineers uh, responsible for the repairs missed these deficiencies. Um, those photos of, of the distress were from them. There's other things that we should be considering too. One is long-term sustained load effects. Concrete does creep. These, these, the structure was loaded at very high levels uh, compared to its capacity for a very long time. Uh, the low top flexural reinforcement ratio we talked about a bit earlier, potentially reducing uh, punching shear capacity. Uh, is definitely a likely cause, a likely contributor um, in terms of the initial design being a bit more inaccurate. Bit inaccurate. Uh, we don't have any clue about how much water was built up in these planters, um, and it could have been significant. And depending on how well they drained, um, it could have been problematic. And based on the drainage, the other drainage that we had seen, and here you can see some of the staining from drainage, um, could be uh, 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 troublesome. And again, the corrosion is, is problematic for us. We, we saw corrosion on site, but we saw nothing so extensive to make us think that it was one of the large contributors, but we don't understand, you know, there's some significance and it could be uh, a, a contributor to the actual class itself. Where does this case stand now? It settled about uh, just over a year, just under a year ago, about 11 months ago. Um, and it's a $1 billion plus settlement from all the defendants and another $120 million or so for the sale of the land. And that's the judge that presided over this. So where do we go, you know, going forward as structural engineers? You know, there's been a lot of code changes since 1977. Uh, I mentioned in integrity reinforcement. There's also the addition of a minimum uh, uh, flexural reinforcement ratio above columns to mitigate what we call deflex or flexural punching shear related issues. And the other thing is the importance of peer review, right? This was another structure that, that had an initial design um, that was a bust, 
right? And so it is really important that, and, and I think the same thing went for the Hyatt Regency collapse in 1981, it, it, the same idea, um, there, there, there was another design that was a bust. And so it's important that peer review is, is still in the engin in instructional engineer's mind. There's a lot of law and code changes happening. Um, you know, you know, Miami Dade's working towards more and more, more um, uh, recertification inspections, as well as the state of Florida has has their new recertification program. Um, and so, uh, we really hope that this gets towards better and more frequent, re better recertifications. Um, but just remember that this building was inspected before it actually collapsed. Um, you also could expect further changes relating to punching shear, right? So in 2019, we saw the addition of an AS min added to ACI 318.19 to mitigate a flexural punching shear related issue. I wouldn't be surprised if you start seeing uh, the effects of flexural behavior uh, uh, taken into uh, the punching shear uh, code or uh, equation. Finally, uh, you know, there is still a need for future research. And so uh, I know that NIST is carrying out uh, punching chair investigations in their, uh, related to their investigation into the collapse. Um, but there's also a need to understand uh, things like progressive collapse and, and the, those mechanisms as well. And, and we look forward to other investigations that come out. With that, I'd like to say thank you uh, for listening and, and we really appreciate your attendance and your time. And I'll pass it back over to Liz. Thank you, Matt, and thanks, Gary. All right, let's take our first question. Given that one of the deductions is that a factor of four is not adequate, would it be correct to conclude that the findings and conclusions of this investigation su suggest that the design codes are not conservative or safe enough and need revising? If that is the case, does WJE intend to challenge the codes on that front? So uh, this is Gary Klein, that's a great question. And Matt addressed that to some extent at the very end of the uh, presentation when he talked about the design codes. And um, ACI has been aware of possible deficiencies in punching shear strength related to the lack of flexural reinforcement for many years and has handled that um, in by requiring a, a minimum concentration of reinforcement at the slot, slab column junction um, that that provides adequate flexural strength in that immediate vicinity. It, it, in, in other words, it, it gets to the intent of critical shear crack theory and Mutani's V-flex analysis and even the Euro code, but kind of in an indirect way. And I know for the 2025 code, there are further requirements for concentration of reinforcement. So uh, I think the code is, is, is so far adequately addressed uh, this deficiency. And remember too, that, that the code was deficient, or rather the design was deficient relative to the 1977 code by quite a large margin. So you have those two, two factors that contribute to the collapse. Okay, our next question, this is going back to the beginning of the presentation. In the 2018 recertification investigation, was a temporary solution shoring until repairs were made? Well, that's a simple one and, and, and I believe the answer is no. Um, there was no shoring specified, and nor were there repairs of strengthening in the pool deck area. Okay, the next question is also a simple one. Was the slab post tensioned? Uh, it was not. Okay. It's interesting that the planter wall at the punching shear failure area did not have diagonal cracks, just horizontal cracks. Please speak to this. Well, I think that goes to the uh, construction of the planters themselves, which, which were uh, made up of CMU units with um, joints, if you will, between the between the units and the cracks were consistent with separation along those joints, uh, both the horizontal joints, right, as the slab deflected, these horizontal cracks appeared, and, and the CMU units were apparently weren't very well interconnected at the re-entrant corner, uh, and, and you had a direct vertical shear failure there. You would certainly expect to see diagonal cracks if it were, for example, uh, planters were made of structural concrete. Okay, our next question. Is the excessive cover from additional dead load slash added thickness or misplaced rebar position? 
can answer well, this one. Good. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and make one. Yeah, I'll jump in. It, it's from uh, misplaced rebar, and what ha often happens is, uh, and, and not always, uh, one is just misplaced, or two, it gets stepped on during construction and pushed downward. Um, so it is. It's important to have chairs that you know are, are properly uh, getting the appropriate rebar height, especially over columns in in flat plate construction. Okay, our next question. Would the addition of drop caps in the latest structural concrete repairs have presented have prevented the collapse? I believe the short answer to that is yes. Um, that would have increased the punching shear perimeter in the pool deck area. Uh, I know uh, we and many other structural engineers, when we find concerns with respect to punching shear in a structure like this, will add uh, what we call shear collars uh, around the columns below the slabs. Uh, essentially as a post-installed drop cap. And of course, if they were initially had columns or had capitals around the, uh, those columns, that would also have prevented the collapse. Okay, please elaborate on what you mean by a design equation versus a predictive equation. Matt, I'll let you take that. Right, so the four root F prime C is an empirical equation based on a, a large set of data and it's it's just uh, there to uh, give a conservative result for most cases. And obviously, we ACI uh, is now aware that there were some issues related to that uh, for uh, bar, uh, slabs that had low what we call low flexural reinforcement. A predictive equation actually considers um, a lot more things in terms and uh, in, in, in doesn't necessarily have to, but considers uh, more parameters often that that actually predict capacity of, of, a, of a, a structural element. Um, and so for instance, uh, a group out of Switzerland has developed what they call critical shear crack theory, which is a predictive equation uh, or predictive method for uh, understanding the punching related capacity of slabs. And it takes into account things like the flexural spacing, the size of aggregate even, um, the size of the crack that's forming and it can take into a lot of different account, different parameters that would actually uh, give a better sense and a more accurate sense of the, the, the actual load. Again, the four root F prime C could, you, you could actually end up with something much, much greater than four roots F prime C. Um, it is just a lower bound uh, empirical number. Okay, how much of the ultimate demand was live load as opposed to dead load or other loads? In terms of design, live load was, we, we, we assumed would have been 100 PSF. That would have been the standard at the time and, 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 and whatnot. I think the dead load um, was considerably uh, a little bit higher, about 125 PSF if we go back to those slides. Um, so it's not significantly different. Okay, for column K13.1, was moisture included in the estimated dead load? No, we, we included soil, an assumed soil weight, but we did not include any additional water weight, no. What do you mean by concrete as a time-dependent material? That's a great question. Gary, you want to answer that one? Well, I'll take a, a shot at it. Um, it, it concrete uh, creeps and micro cracks over time. It, it's somewhat like wood in that respect. And, and in, in wood, there's specific requirements uh, for time-dependent effects in the design, which is not true of concrete. And uh, it, it, the, that issue is usually masked by you design for both dead and live load. And had that been adequately done, the fact that the concrete may not have been as strong under full-time sustained load becomes less important because you're designing for this additional uh, live load. But in, in terms of the collapse analysis, it's highly important because there was very little live load This collapsed under dead load only and probably at a, uh, a load lower uh, than it would have collapsed immediately, right? That, that there was no specific trigger, rather the, the accumulation of damage, if you will, over time eventually led to the punching failure. Okay, this person said, sorry if I missed it, but were the structural calculations I'm sorry, my list just jumped. Let me get back to that. Uh, were the structural calculations based on concrete compression tests or on theoretical concrete expectations? Well, if that question goes to our calculations, we we looked at both, right? Uh, Matt outlined the analysis based on 
as design conditions. And in any collapse investigation, you want to answer two questions. Was it adequately designed? So you have to assume design conditions, that is specified concrete strength, specified dimensions, uh, reinforcement in the proper place. Um, but you have also have to reconcile load and resistance at the time of the collapse. And, and to do that, you, you use actual material properties. Our best estimate of what the concrete strength was, uh, steel reinforcing strength, the actual loads uh, at the time, which were much lower, uh, and, and those kinds of things, which gives you different, a sort of a separate analysis, but both are important in terms of understanding the collapse. Okay. Were the L-shaped building wings and pool built as one structure, i.e. no expansion joints? That's, that's correct. There was no expansion joint. And okay. some argued that there per perhaps should have been, but uh, that's more familiar than, with Florida construction of that era than I am, but I don't think that would have been common at that time. Although, um, you know, in hindsight, had that been done, that would have uh, prevented this progressive collapse in all likelihood. And, and that's something in addition to, you know, punching shear, as an industry, the structural engineers have to pay more attention to the possibility of progressive collapse. It's indeed unfortunate that the collapse of a pool deck uh, leads to the subsequent collapse of a 12-story condominium. All right, what type of foundation was the building resting on? Piling, drilled shaft, spread footings? How deep was the foundation and how deep was the bedrock? I'll take a shot at that. But it was uh, it, the uh, they chose to use what's called Frankie piles, also known as uh, pressure injected footings, uh, which um, are constructed by um, ramming uh, a concrete a concrete like material through a sleeve, and it's sort of a, both a soil improvement. Um, and, and point bearing technique and, and those pressure injected footings or Frankie piles only extended down. I think we ultimately found out about 13 or 14 feet. Um, yeah, in the pool deck area for sure. In the pool deck area. Um, and uh, again, based on uh, other evidence, we do not think that foundations uh, played a role in the collapse. Okay, you stated that concrete is a time-dependent structure. However, concrete gains strength over time. With your findings showing a low carbonation front, can you advise on why the structure failed only recently despite being under-designed from the start? Well, we try to address that to some extent in, in, in that concrete is a, a time-dependent material, but the question is also right that, that concrete gains strength over time uh, and especially not so much modern concretes, but older concretes where there's additional hydration that occurs. And, and, and we've seen concrete strengths uh, that you know, might improve by 50% after quite a number of years. Uh, I'm not sure that that was relevant here, but we do know that that load was sustained for all that time. And, and uh, uh, as Matt alluded to, um, the concrete will fail at a lower load under sustained load. All right. Would integrity steel have prevented the collapse? So by integrity steel, uh, I think what the questioner is referring to is, is the requirement for reinforcement to cross over the top of a column, the bottom mat of reinforcement, uh, in both directions with at least two bars. Um, and the notion is if you get a, something like a punching failure or other traumatic event, that those bars that pass over the columns uh, act as catenaries, if you will, between columns to uh, support the slab and prevent uh, progressive collapse. So the answer is quite possibly it, it properly installed integrity reinforcement, which uh, they did not deliberately have in this case, um, that may have prevented the, the progressive collapse. Gary, we received a couple questions um, asking what you mean by catenary. Can you expound on that a little more? I should, we should have anticipated that by a cantonary, a, a, a cable supporting uh, a suspension bridge is a cantonary. 
So that for a while, the, we use the term catenary in this sense when we talked about the the collapse of the pool deck and how it would, it took a, a catenary shape, a smile like shape, right? Um, and and it, as it did so, it induced. If you know, we're not certain about this because we, we don't have complete evidence, but had it gone into that shape, it would pull very laterally on the supports, just like the, uh, you know, abutments of a suspension bridge, if you will. Um, and and, and uh, that we think was a, f may have been a factor in how the collapse progressed into, uh, into the building itself is by virtue of that horizontal force at, at the south building columns. Okay. What would have been recommended upgrades, if any, that could have been applied? So another question alluded to this, and 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 uh, for the punching shear itself, right? The the obvious uh, solution is some kind of shear collars installed uh, on the upper part of the columns below the uh, the slabs of the pool deck, right? The the building columns, by the way, the punching shear was not as critical because those columns are much larger, so there was a much larger punching shear perimeter. So. Um, uh, shear collars in the pool deck if it would have been something that addressed the punching problem. In addition, there was a lack of flexural reinforcement, and that should have been addressed as well. And, and actually, they did some of that in the recertification. They added some flexural reinforcement in the uh, west entrance area uh, without doing anything with shear. Uh, um, and, and we would have needed to do that as well to address the, uh, uh, the deficiency in flexural reinforcement. Okay, we've got time for about two more. This question says, on the news, it was reported that there was exposed rebar in the pool room. Did any fumes from chlorine cause any added corrosion and weaken the rebar? Yeah, so in that, that, that area was, is, is actually still intact at the site. And that was, um, that was uh, support, supporting uh, the actual pool deck, pool room itself and pool area wasn't actually a structural component for uh, the building itself and so yeah it, it, there is chlorine in that area and chlorine definitely uh, was likely uh, getting on things and causing corrosion extensive corrosion in that area but that was not linked to the actual um, structural pool deck uh, if that makes sense and we want to be clear and i Matt alluded to this that corrosion was um uh, it's not it, it, we did not as definitively address the, its contribution as we would have liked we got lots of core samples from the uh, lower uh, slab, the basement slab, if you will, for the parking deck, and, and the chloride levels were very low. There, there was no evidence of corrosion on the bars. You saw a few cores with, without evidence of a lot of corrosion, but we didn't uh, get to examine as many samples as we would have liked of the pool deck itself. But to the extent we saw those kinds of specimens in the primary evidence facility, we did not see obvious evidence that that corrosion contributed, like you might see in a northern climate with the laminations and, and excessive corrosion of the reinforcement. All right, one final question about possible contributing factors. Was there any evidence of automobiles bumping, uh, bumping into the columns creating damage? None that we know of. Um, the collapse occurred in the, in the early morning hours um, and our knowledge there was not much activity in the area at that time um, the, the, the columns presumably in the basement level could have been vulnerable to something like that but uh, there were no reports of, of any contributions from that type of thing all right that's all the time that we have for questions today thank you matt and thank you gary for the great presentation and very interesting q a time and thank you all for joining us and for hanging on a little longer past the end of the hour. We hope it was educational. If you have any questions about today's presentation, please don't hesitate to reach out to Gary or to Matt. They'd be happy to answer your questions. And if you have questions about WJE webinars, please reach out to us at webinars at wje.com. So again, thank you so much for your time and we hope you have a great rest of the day.